It's no secret, I'm a huge fan of Parkhurst boots. In this almond toe shaped last, combined with Halloween's famous waxed flesh, it is a perfect blend of style and ruggedness that I can only describe as an unpolished beauty. G'day, welcome back to Bootlosophy, and my name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways on which I live and work, the Wajik people. Today, I'm going to review my fourth mid-2024 Parkhurst buy, this pair of Allen boots in brown wax flesh. The Allen is Parkhurst's plain toe service boot. This version is a stitch down boot, which I'll explain when I go into the construction. Aesthetically, it has all the badges of a service boot. Uh, it has the Derby or Derby open lacing system. It has a low block heel, six inches high at the shaft, and a reasonably plain uh, pattern of leather pieces made up of the vamp, uh, two quarters, and a single piece backstay that cups the veg tan leather external heel counter. Made from Halloween's waxed flesh, this one is in a dark brown, uh, expect it to be a patina monster, uh, but only after a heck of a lot of wear, which I'll explain in a minute. As a result, expect it to be a casual pair of boots that you pair with very casual outfits rather than smart casual with, say, wool pants, for example. So I find pairing it with denim jeans as being the best bet. In this case, I'm showing you dark selvage denim from Gustin in their slim fit, paired with a work shirt like this from Timberland, and a flint and tinder wax trucker jacket. As the selvage denim fades, so the wax flesh will patina and keep the fit going. In this case, I'm showing what the boots look like with a more faded denim. In this case, the flint and tinder all-American stretch denim jean in their slim fit. In this case, I'm pairing it with a simple black t-shirt. I don't think it quite goes yet because the wax flesh hasn't started scuffing, but you can see how the dark brown will easily go with black and dark denim. For a third look, I wear these boots with black chinos and a black shirt. At the moment, while the wax flesh is reasonably intact, I can get away with it because it's dark. But once it does scuff and patina, I probably switch the black chinos for a pair of faded black jeans. If necessary, in the cold, I can also throw on a brown leather jacket or some other warm layer uh, in a dark brown or black. Before we go on, I'll put links to some of the brands down in the description area below. Some of them will be affiliate links, which pay me a five to 6% commission, depending uh, if you buy from those links. So if you wanted to buy anything already and you use those links, you'd actually be supporting my channel, which I thank you for. And of course, if you wanted to support my channel without spending any money, I'd appreciate it if you click on the like and subscribe buttons down there. Moving on, I'll take a little time uh, to talk about the brand. In the last few weeks, I have released uh, review videos of the Parkhurst boots that I bought in June of 2024. So if you watch those, I'm not gonna repeat everything I say about the brand, but I'm not gonna presume that you watch all my videos. So I will say a little bit about the brand here so you don't miss it. If you did want to watch the other Parkers reviews, I'll put links to the videos down below, and if I can work out how, uh, I'll flash them up here uh, as well. But quickly here, let's talk a little about Parkhurst. Parkhurst was founded in 2018 by Andrew Savisco, uh, who's a former stock analyst, as a small batch manufacturer of American-style heritage boots. As a small batch manufacturer, Parkhurst's model was to buy uh, limited stocks of hides in traditional and exotic leathers uh, from Seidel's smooth grain leathers to uh, Charles Stead's waxed and shrunken suede, uh, taking in along the way some leathers like moose, kudu and horse butt. The design philosophy was to combine a well-fitting last, that's the foot shape, in a slimmed down service boot design with interesting exotic and rugged leathers and build them on a variety of outsoles from studded day nights to comfortable Ridgeway and the commando lugged styles. Andrew also started with a desire to keep his supply chains local, uh, contracting a boot factory in Batavia, New York, near where he's based in Buffalo, 
as well as buy supplies from local suppliers, even if that meant buying, say, UK tannery Stead's leathers through a US supplier rather than buying direct. Unfortunately, COVID nearly destroyed his business and did devastate his US supply chains with many of his suppliers, including the Batavia factory, which closed for good. However, his contacts put him in touch with a Spanish factory and after two lean years where the Parker's website went down to no more than three or four models available at any one time, Andrew survived in the smell of an oily rag and he pulled through. As more and more models came out of the Spanish factory, 2024 culminated in a true rebirth for Parker's with many models appearing in stock. And in 2024, Andrew also explored stitch down construction with a Portuguese factory that had the skills and capacity to produce stitch down boots. Go check out his website now uh, in the description area below to see the various models of service boots, mock toes, and even chuckers and derby shoes. Turning to construction now, let's look at the way that the boot is built from the bottom up. This is put together using the stitch down method of construction. The uppers leather is lasted or pulled over the foot shape last to form the shape of the uppers. And then the edges are flared out and glued and stitched to the midsole and the outsole. In this case, it's a double row stitch down, meaning two stitches go through the top of the flared out uppers and the midsole, but only one stitch goes through all the way uh, to stitch in the outsole. The back end is tucked in and glued and stitched to the insole, but it's also affixed with nails. This form of construction allows for a sturdy lasting build as well as water resistance because the water kind of rolls off the, the, the vamp and the turned out uppers. Goodyear welt enthusiasts would probably beg to differ and I'm not really 100% sure which is more water resistant to tell you the truth. Uh, the outsole itself is a Parkhurst branded proprietary commando lug outsole. It's a full slip outsole that goes the whole length of the boot and at the heel it's topped by a glued and nailed leather heel stack finished usually by Andrew himself in his Buffalo warehouse with a commando lug top lift that's also glued and I think you can see the reflections nailed. The interesting thing I found is that the Portuguese commando outsoles seem to have a lower profile than the Spanish ones. Now I don't know uh, if they're different manufacturers or just the specs that they're given. The uh, rubber is softer than Vibram's V100 Commander outsoles or even their 430 Mini Lug outsoles and I have to say they feel comfortable. The midsole is a double layer of veg tan Benz leather and truthfully uh, does need a bit of wear to break in and, and get it to bend comfortably. To be honest, I haven't had much of a chance to wear this since June but in the last six months I have worn it in an urban situation maybe 12-15 times and it feels like it's only just beginning to break in. Uh, inside the boot, the inside is also veg tan Benz leather uh, in, on the insole, so it's very firm and supportive with, I think there's a cork filler underneath. I us usually can feel the impression uh, of my feet snuggling into it to form its own orthotic support. Oh, by the way, being stitched down, I'm not actually sure there is a filler at all, but if there is, Parker's always uses cork, not foam. There is, however, for sure a steel shank that bridges the gap under the arch, and provides arch support from collapsing as well as torsional stability over uneven ground. Moving on up, the inside of the vamp is lined with a soft leather lining but the shaft is unlined. The uppers are made from Horween's wax flesh. Now let's break that down a bit. Firstly, Horween is a renowned tannery from Chicago in the US and it produces the ubiquitous Chrome Excel leather tannage. Interestingly, this is actually Chrome Excel uh, turned inside out as you can see from the natural chrome excel smoothness and color on the inside. Wax flesh is a form of leather that is turned rough side out and then the rough out nap is covered with a very thick coat of wax uh, that more than makes it oily uh, like on Charles Epstead's Waxy Commando uh, suede. Waxy Commando is designed to crack and show the suede nap very very quickly meaning the suede color uh, under the darker wax comes out. It protects the suede from moisture, but it's not a work boot leather and dare I say it is largely for fashion. Wax flash on the other hand is designed as a hardy, heavily waxed rough out that can and is used for work boots. 
as I said, I've only worn this 12 or so times, uh, none of it in situations where I'm scuffing it or I'm under the car scratching it on the concrete. And the only part that's ever beginning to show the wax wear off is on the tongue. Now someone once accused me of lying when I said I'd only worn a Waxy Commander boot twice because it looks so scuffed. Uh, but that's what Waxy Commander does, especially with a light coloured base. Wax Flash, on the other hand, has such a thick coating of wax on it that when new, it almost looks like smooth grain leather instead of rough out. And it takes a lot of wear and in tough situations to even show it cracking. I have a pair of White's MP boots in cinnamon wax flesh, which I have worn in my garage workshop and on the hiking trail, and that does show a lot of patina. You can check out that video up there. You can see on the vamp that even uh, with the couple of handfuls of wear that the rolls are starting to form, uh, but without any creasing. Until the wax wears off, the vamp will crack rather than crease and then the rough out nap showing will prevent any really bad creasing anyway. I really find the texture, especially in the shaft where it's become a little more uh, supple, very appealing in its roughness, even before the wax cracks or scuffs. The stitching on the uppers is really first class, very clean and consistent and not loose or there's any misstitching at all. It's quadruple and double stitch where it's needed. Uh, the stitching on the stitch down, it's also clean and consistent. I believe this is machine stitch rather than hand stitch, but still, you need a steady and practice hand guiding the boot through the machine. The stitch per inch or SPI density is not particularly uh, fine, like a Weiberg say, but people say that a, a, a really dense SPI might be really tricky to resole because your cobbler has to match his stitches into the very fine old holes. Otherwise, uh, stitching too many holes into the uppers may turn it into the perforated edge like toilet paper. Um, the edges of the leather are cut edges as befits a rugged boot and the hardware is equally tough antique brass. Five eyelets, three speed hooks, all back down really well with no rough edges to feel. The tongue is partially gusseted up to the last eyelet to provide a, a little bit more protection from moisture and dirt. All in all, well thought through and well executed. As for caring for wax flesh, it's a pretty tough coating, but nevertheless, you do want to protect it from drying out, especially once the wax cracks and the uh, rough, uh, uh, rough out nap starts to show. Parkhurst website recommends Smith's uh, uh, Big Four or any neutral color cream wax or balm. Truman Boots, who are famous for their Java wax flesh boot, like this one up here, suggest their proprietary leather protector, which I understand is a very uh, waxy balm anyway, like Smith's. In my personal opinion, I'd leave wax flesh alone as far as I can do so. Certainly keep it clean by wiping it down with a damp cloth and then brush it if it gets dirty. As the nap starts to show, I'd spray on a suede protector like the ones you can get from Red Wing or RM Williams or a waterproof spray like the Tarago Nano Spray. If it really feels dry and dried out, I would probably apply Big Four more than a waxy balm because I, I think a waxier cream or balm is likely to darken the rough out showing. And if you like the patina that's developing, Big Four will condition but not cover it with a replacement waxy surface. As for sizing, fit and comfort, um, first the sizing. This is made in Parkhurst's 618 last, which is a combination last with a, uh, a narrow heel and waist and opening to just above E width at the ball before coming back into an almond shaped toe. The 618 last is designed to look sleek without squeezing your toes but it does clamp your heel in place and it provides good arch support through the narrow waist. For most people, you would take a half size down from your Brannock device size and maybe up to a full size down from your sneaker size. I'll give you my own example. I size 8.5D in US sizing on Brannock and I wear a 9 in Nikes. In Red Wing, Ellen Edmonds, uh, Grant Stone, almost all other US heritage brands, I take an 8D. For UK sizing countries like the UK, Australia, some of Canada uh, and South Africa, uh, that's a seven and a half true size. Uh, since most of Commonwealth countries manufacturers make footwear that's true to size. With all that information, I ordered a size eight in Parkhurst. 
However, if your feet are especially wide or you have like splayed toes or something, contact Andrew because I have heard people say that their feet just don't work in Parkhurst's combination lasts. As for fit, the 618 last in a size 8 for me is perfect for my pretty average but imperfect feet. The narrow heel locks in my heel to reduce heel slip uh, even when it's new. The narrow waist grabs my midfoot and the design tucks the upper zin under your arch so that you feel an extra structural arch support. The width at the ball of the foot provides a lot of comfort despite the low profile and the slightly extra length allows the toes to narrow in without actually squeezing your toes into a tight toe box. The uh, boots are shock absorbing enough I think and really comfortable whether standing or walking. At the time of recording, the boots sell for 668 Australian dollars or 438 USD. It's hard to compare value in Australia because we just don't make boots like these. I don't think you can compare handmade boots like Wooden's because that's a whole different category and the closest is RM Williams which mostly sell for the mid to high 600s. In the US though, where these will have the biggest market, they compare well with other brands of similar quality. Grantstone boots, for example, sell for under 400 uh, US and while incredibly well made from the highest quality materials, has the advantage of being made in China with the relatively low cost of production. Truman sell their Java Wax Flash for 480 USD and they are comparable in build and quality in my opinion, but with US wage rates I guess. I don't think you can rightly compare these with uh, Pacific Northwest boots, but they are more consistent in quality than those, even if they're factory made rather than PNW handmade at PNW prices. I think overall that price to value ratio is fair to pretty darn good. And in summary, I think that's my fairest call given that uh, Parkers is probably my favorite brand. I like the look, I like the philosophy of the maker, and I like the more recent consistency in quality from the Spanish and Portuguese factories. There you have it. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to also click on like and please subscribe if you haven't already. That would really help me out and help me grow my channel. I'm continuing to bring you more boot reviews and boot related videos, so keep an eye out for my next video. Until then, take care out there and see you again soon.